I swear I had a nice pretty picture here, but clearly it's not here. <laughs> True. Okay, so now we've <clears throat> we've worked out the hydrogen atom solution. As I said earlier, we're it's not the final solution because we have to take in things that aren't ideal in real life, but it's a good start. And so far we've only made one measurement. That one measurement is the energy levels. We had that the energy, whoops, the highlighter is not the prime tool. The energy sub N is equal to energy one over N squared, where energy one was equal to a whole bunch of stuff, which turns out to be minus 13.6 electron volts. So that's what we found for the hydrogen atom so far. We found the energy states and we have the wave function that should give us everything else. So what we're going to look at today is, well, what else can we get out of this wave function? And we're going to start and end today, at least, with angular momentum. First things first, why would we care about the angular momentum of an electron in an atom? Angular momentum is a V squared over R, right? Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to, it, it, angular momentum is, no, that, that's centripetal, or yeah, that's centripetal acceleration, but it's, angular momentum is not I, it's L. L is equal to I omega is equal to, and it's a vector is equal to M R cross P. Well, one, one thing about angular momentum is there's a rotational kinetic energy. Just like kinetic energy translation, it's P squared over 2M. What's I again? Is it oh, sorry. I is the moment of inertia. <laughs> and actually, I, I put this here without thinking. I'm pretty sure that it, you can just replace M with I everywhere and P with L everywhere. So I just wrote it. But the, the rotational kinetic energy, there's energy in rotation. So if it has a different angular momentum, it's going to have a different kinetic energy, hence a different energy. So the angular momentum is going to have to affect the energy state in some way. We haven't seen it yet, but we will. Then there's another thing that's more important, really, I think. And that is, if you're in a magnetic field, it makes a measurable difference because you have a magnetic moment created by having a charged particle that's moving or spinning. And so there's going to be energy associated with the magnetic moment that comes out of the angular momentum. So to me, that makes a difference that's important because it's measurable. Everything that we're doing here has to be measurable in some way or it's not very useful to us. And these things are energy variations are measurable. You know, you <clears throat> take gas and you excite it and it gives off light. And that light depends on the different energy levels. It's falling from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And so we can directly probe the differences in the energy levels. And so, you know, we have the whole Rydberg, well, the Balmer series that said for hydrogen atoms, the wavelength, uh, actually, it's, I think, the 
I think it's one over wavelength is equal to this. Um, yeah. And you, you can put that together because <clears throat> energy is HC over lambda is equal to the energy in the final state minus energy in the initial state is equal to So you can use what we have done here to get an equation that says that says that's a one on top. I know it looks like a Y. One over wavelength is equal to this stuff. So that Rydberg constant must be this here. And so <clears throat> we had experimentally observed energy spectra before this was developed. And then we could test the prediction of this against the observed energy spectra. And that's one of the reasons to throw away the Bohr model's results. The Bohr model, one of the reasons for the Bohr model was because they saw a discrete line spectra, which would indicate that you have discrete energy levels. But you didn't have a perfect matchup, and the Bohr model did not have a way to explain how you'd have slight variations. You have lines that break out to like a set of lines instead of just one. And if you put a magnetic field, they shift. The Bohr model didn't have a way to deal with that. And so we get to the quantum model which right now we're equivalent to the Bohr model in our outcomes, but which we'll develop into explaining those. And so angular momentum is important for that purpose. So that's why we're looking at angular momentum. This here, I just reminded you about the relationship between Cartesian coordinates and your spherical coordinates. So that you can replace, you know, X hat is... Yeah, I've got a problem here. It shouldn't have a hat. It should just be, <laughs> yeah. I, I did not do a very good job here. It should just be X, Y, and Z. If you have something that is a radius R and angle phi and theta, then your X component should be R sine theta, cosine phi, and so on. This here is important and Orbitron was simply the website was down. There was something malformed. I went to every computer I have and it, all of them were doing the same thing. But Orbitron is working today. So I want to look at Orbitron actually. Well, let's talk about this then go to Orbitron. If I want to find the probability of finding the radius between R and R plus DR up until today. So let's go like this. Up until today. Everything we've done says the probability is equal to the integral of psi mod squared. Well, the probability of being between R and R plus DR would just be that. That's what we've done for everything so far. But for a spherical distribution, radius is how far you are from the center. It's not taken into account anything around the, the going around a circle. So when you're saying, you know, what's the probability of being this far away from the center, you have to take into account that it could be anywhere on the surface of a sphere with that radius. And so what you actually have to do is you have to do, I re, yeah, you have to put DV, the volume difference. And so if your dr is changing, then you're going to have a sphere with dv is equal to dr times the area of the sphere. Area of a sphere is 4 pi radius squared. So the probability of being between radius r and r plus dr is going to have to be equal to psi mod squared times 4 pi r squared dr. 
It's a little different, which is what I have written right here. <laughs> the, <clears throat> this here is assuming spherical symmetry. So now let's go to Orbitron and learn some things from Orbitron. Maybe. Please still be open. It looks, oh yeah, here's this, this window. Okay, so looking at a 1S orbital from Orbitron. Did you guys take a look at this before? Okay, by the way, I tried to change the scale with Chrome browser and it wouldn't let me change. You know why? I've actually figured this out and didn't think about it until now. The first tab, there's a bug with Chrome browser and it won't let you change the magnification for a first tab. Yep. So here we open it up again. Now I'll be able to change the magnification. Maybe. Yep. <laughs> okay. So actually that's a little too much. This will work for us. So here I'm going to look at the 1S orbital. And it should be loading 1S orbital. There it's loading it. So here's our 1s orbital. I am really not sure what this thing is down here at the bottom of the screen, but I'm not going to mess with it. Here's what you used to see for 1s orbital. It looks like a sphere. Hmm. Apparently I have some ability to draw. Yeah, look at that. Don't know what I'm using, but it's going to allow me to draw. And my eraser draws too, it turns out. So this is what you're used to seeing for a 1s orbital. What does that mean? probability of the electron being in that area or that volume. That's right. That's telling us, okay, I chose a 95% probability. There's 95% probability of being within this volume. That's what it means. And of course, did he choose 95%? Did he choose 93%? You know, I don't know what percentage he chose, but that's what it's telling us. Now the wave function. Okay. Back to the pointer. It's going to come. Here's a plot of the wave function. If you look at this wave function and you're naive, you say, well, let's just take that and take the mod squared of it. So the electron density is going to do the mod squared. And you'd say, where am I most likely to find the electron? Naively, what would you say? In the middle. In the middle. But that's not right. Because of what we just did, you have to multiply by the 4 pi r squared, right? Because you have virtually no volume there at the center. You go out, the volume is getting bigger. So if you mul multiply by the 4 pi r squared, you get, wait for it, this. Where is this most likely to be found? What's its most probable location? Okay, so there's the most probable, sorry, my hand also wrote. <laughs> there's the most probable location for it to be found. Now that's the most probable, it's not the, the average. Where would the average be compared to the most probable? That's right, because it's asymmetric. And asymmetry pushes it off to the right. So we have there, the Bohr radius is the most probable radius. So this here is going to be the Bohr radius. Now, we haven't done anything to show that. I probably will give you a homework problem to show it. Okay, so that's the 1s. What's the difference in a 1s and a 2s? electrons it's not more electrons if I have 1s the 1 means n equals 1 the s means l equals 0 if I have a 2s what is the 2 mean n is 2 n is 2 
from what we've learned so far, we have two ways of, of interpreting N is 2, both of them being correct interpretations. What is one interpretation of N is 2? Okay, that's the second energy level. It's a higher energy state. What's the other interpretation? That, the, that it has a probability of being in more places because it has a higher energy? We, we haven't like, gone that far yet, but the second interpretation that we have seen is what N is. N is telling us about the J-max. We had a relationship that said N is equal to J-max plus L plus 1. And so if N is 2, what does L tell us? <laughs> Darn it. What does S tell us? It tells us L is 0. So if N is 2 and L is 0, then we can say initially, or immediately... J max is equal to N minus L minus 1 equals 2 minus 0 minus 1 equals 1. Whereas up here, J max was 0. So we have one more term. That is, the first term is radius raised to the 0th power. Now we have a second term. That is, for n equals 2, we have a second term, one that has j raised to the first power. So this is the highest power of j in our polynomial, or in our polynomial, the highest power we give to r. <clears throat> so now let's go back and look at what we get for a 2s. And first I've got to change over so I'm not writing. So here's the 2s. Go ahead. Um, what does the NP tell us? Okay, what does the P tell us? That, that's a good question. It's one that I haven't discussed, but it's very important. Does somebody know that? I thought I heard somebody say yeah. J. Yeah, from chemistry. Okay, because there is no I. So these are simply no notice uh, nomen um, spectroscopic notation for the L value. Okay. So. The P would tell us L is 1, D would tell us L is 2, and so on. I had one student that said, why are we going up to like H? H doesn't exist. Well, does it or doesn't it? If you look at a periodic table, the, um, the first row is only filling L equals 0, N equals 1, L equals 0. The second row is filling N equals 2, L equals 0 and L equals 1. The third one, oddly, is only filling 3 N equal, or N equals 3, L equals 0, and L equals 1. There should be an L equals 2 option there, right? But it's not there. The reason is because it affects the energy. The, the electrons, when you put them in, you fill from the lowest energy up. And it turns out N equals... 3 L equals 2 is higher energy than N equals 4 L equals 0. And so that's why you have the same number of columns in the second and third rows. Well, you go down to the next two and you're filling L equals 2. The, the first one had L equals one, 0. Second two have L equals 0 and L equals 1. The next two have L equals 0, 1, and 2, and then the next two have the lanthanide and the actinide series, which is getting you up to L equals 3. So on the periodic table, this is as high as appears on the periodic table.
if they are in the ground state. So she was saying these don't exist. They don't exist for the ground state. But if you excite it from the ground state, you're going to be exciting up to these higher levels. So they're just not part of the ground state. Yeah. Okay. okay, back to our pretty pictures. So what's different about the 2s orbital as compared to the 1s orbital? <laughs> it looks like it has large volume. It, it, I'm sure it does have larger volume. But there's another thing. Yeah, you've got this thing here. And then you've got the outer part, the red part and the blue part. And you're probably wondering, what's the difference in the red part and the blue part? Are you? Yes. Okay, here's the difference in the red part and the blue part. Psi is positive for the red part, psi is negative for the blue part. Does it matter if it's positive or negative? Not really, except where it crosses zero. Well, you could have, what's your probability, no matter what you do, what's your probability of being at the location where psi crosses zero? Zero. So there's no probability of being at the point between those two spheres. So you have a small sphere with a bigger sphere with a region in between where there's no probability. And of course, that is seen more clearly. Here we have the electron density. So now we're just taking radius and you can see how that picture came to be. Those are like what, what people think about nodes, right? Where the probability is zero. That is correct. That's correct. So you can see here how that picture was drawn just by the slider going up and down. And finally, the radial distribution. Because we have the additional term, because J max was one, we now have two peaks. You would say this. This is clearly the most probable peak, but there is a probability peak in here as well. It's just not as high. So it's a, it's a more complicated distribution. Now that's the 2s, we go to 2p. What does 2p tell you? It tells you two things. N equals two. N equals two. two and L equals yes. <laughs> Let's stop and think. So, uh, on this distribution, yeah, is the uh, on the on the distribution we were just looking at. Does the smaller peak correspond to? Is that to the red or to the blue? Um. The, the smaller peak was actually the, the red. Well, it depends on which picture you're looking at. For probability, when you put in the four pi r squared, the blue is the one that's, that's bigger. Yeah. If you just look at it without that, the red was bigger. But you have to look at the whole thing. You can't just look at without the four pi r squared. <clears throat> now here, things are no longer symmetrical. They're no longer spherically symmetrical because now we have a spherical harmonic with L not equal to zero. And so when we look at the wave function, the wave function is basically going to be drawn out in the, well, the z-axis if we were looking at the first one, the x-axis if we're looking at the second one, or the y-axis if we're looking at the third one. So you've got that dumbbell shape. Why well, suppose you have different colors? Okay, so let's look. Exactly. And so this here is, it's showing only one of the three variations. What's the difference in three variations? The orientation of the angular momentum. 
And so this is showing one of them. You have a two-dimensional picture here, but then you have a more illustrative three-dimensional picture, picture there. And you can see how it plays together. I do like that I can draw on it. I just need to learn. And so here we see taking the psi mod squared times 4 pi r, well, that's using the 4 pi r squared. We now see that we have the two lobes, one that was positive, one that was negative, as you said. And here he changed to red and blue again. I say he, I don't know who made this. And finally, the radial distribution. What is J? Okay, too late. I can't cover it with my hand as it turns out. I can't see it, but you can. <laughs> What is J max in this case? N is 2, L is 1, what's J max? Zero. Thus, this looks exactly like what we had for the 1S because that was also J max is zero. Okay, so let's say I go to the 3D. If I go to the 3D, what shape are we going to – well, let's not go there. Let's go to the 3S. What's the 3S going to look like based on what you've seen so far? The, the first picture that's going to pop up. It's going to be a sphere. Can you be more specific about that sphere? <laughs> uh, it has got a three sections, I guess. Okay, well, kind of. The middle is going to zero. Here's our wave function. Actually, I guess it's not going to zero. It looked like in that picture, but it was a dot. So it is three sections. And the electron density here will give us a little more. Not much more. And then looking at the radial distribution, you're going to have how many peaks? Three. Okay. What's the three P going to look like? A little more predictive work required. Uh, That's right. You're going to have two above and two below. Oh, okay. and, and we'll, we'll yeah. see here. It should be loading up. <laughs> yeah, there it's loading up. So you see you've got this little piece here and this little piece here are the little ones and then you have the big ones. To me, that looks kind of like an old-fashioned doorknob. Yeah, that's not good. Especially the colors they have. Yeah. I, I think they actually spent time trying saying, what color is going to look really cool for this? Yeah. So you look here at the three-dimensional wave function thing, and that, that's pretty cool looking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, electron. Go ahead. We have, for our radio we have two things. Yes. J max. J max is one, yeah. And so you see here, here he's reverted once again to red and blue, so you can see the, the differences in them, the positive and negative. And finally, the rate of distribution, because you guys have this nailed now, but I have to stick with the program. Two. All right, 3D. Haven't seen a D orbital yet. And it's not loading yet. Now it's loading. Yes, it will. Or wait, 3D, yes. It's going to be one peak. Now you look at this, and four of these look normal. You have, let's say, four eggs distributed in a plane. One of them 
Not so much. That's really interesting that they don't all look the same, just different orientations. So, how would we interpret these five different That's that's a good question. How do we interpret them? What do they re represent is the first thing. Now, I haven't gotten to actually what the M and L's truly represent. That's part of today's lecture that I'm guessing now that we spent two thirds of the lecture, I'm not going to fully get into. <laughs> um, but the L is telling us the total angular momentum. And so all of these have the same total angular momentum. The M is telling us the orientation. As you may have guessed, this one here is the one with m equals zero. That's the one that says that the angular momentum orientation is perpendicular to the direction you, you applied your external magnetic field. These other ones are partially aligned with it. So they're, they're telling you, you about the orientation of the magnetic field. And yet you look at these and you're like, <coughs> I, don't, I don't see it, right? I don't see how this is having anything to do with the orientation of the magnetic field. And sadly, that's the end of my extent of knowledge on this. I'm not sure how magnetic, you know, the, the angular momentum orientation, you know, how is this going to be a different orientation? Well, I could say this is in the, you know, it looks like X direction maybe, and this one looks like it's Y direction. This one looks like it's Z direction. And this one looks like it's also Z direction, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to differentiate how those are different orientations. Well, this one here is going to be in the plus Z direction. And this one here is going to be in the minus Z direction. So that's the difference in those two. And then these here are oriented. So it's partially in between. And, and I say plus C and minus C, they can't be fully plus C, fully minus C. That's, that's not here, no, or that's not part of what I'm doing today. <laughs> so that's as far as I can go with that. Go ahead, what? Um, the spin is talking about the angular momentum of the electron. And so, no, it's not correlated to the spin. Because this is the angular momentum of the orbital, not of the electron. Okay. But they're both angular momentum, so obviously there, is, there are connections. Okay, so if we look at the wave function here, and I'm going to, of course, stop looking at everything. Notice this here is only showing four of them have this, the four that look the same. The 3D Z squared, as it's called here, is going to look different. So here's the one that looks different. It doesn't have, actually, this took me, darn it. It took me back. So let's go straight to the radial distribution for this one. That's exactly the same as we're going to get for the others. Uh, if you go back to the wave function, On our graph, why do we see the, the red, but we don't see the blue? You do. You have the blue. I will use green here to highlight. The blue peaks are both negative down here. Uh, that's supposed to be blue, but that sure as life looks black. <laughs> yeah, I apparently hit black. Okay, that blue is so close you can't tell. Green then, green. Those are the blue peaks, and you can't see the rest of the way up because it's being blocked by the red on top. Okay. Well, on the T -B -B on the, yeah, on the XY graph or the T D graph, is it because they're the same the same function? You're talking about on this Yes. This one here? Well, okay. Well on this one it, is it so the reason why we don't see the blue on the, the y squared the graph, the 
Okay, I know, I know which one you're talking about now by, by the process of elimination on this one, right? Okay, this one. <laughs> uh, so, oh, this oh, one. So we have the, the, two red the picture in the top yeah. left corner. No. This graph is drawn on this axis. Hence, it's all red. If you were to come off axis and draw it on this axis, then you would see both the red and the blue. Mm -hmm. okay. That makes sense. okay, so I'm going to skip over the P's and just go straight to the 4D and 4F. And then we're going to go back to the lecture because I mean, hey, we got to do something that's not looking pretty pictures for ten minutes. <laughs> it's still not loading. Now it's loading. I got to sit there and look at the tab. Some way I can tell apparently. So here's the forty. Now that's getting more fun, right? And if we go to just go to the electron density and then the equation. Oh, not the, so here's the, the electron density picture, pretty cool. And the radial distribution picture. Right, it's, it's the next to last one, which means it's going to have J max is one. One thing I haven't shown you is this does show you the equations that these are built on. So here's the equations that they're built on, the spherical harmonics. Um, notice the nomenclature is different for his spherical harmonics and then the total wave function which is the radial function times the spherical harmonic and so you can see all the equations that were used to make these and i said we'd end on the 4f and the 4f we shall look at loading now so here's the 4f Life is getting more interesting a lot. <laughs> and I don't think in chemistry you ever look at pictures like this. And it seems like you should, you know, it's, I mean, when you're doing chemistry, you know, you look at this and you're saying, if it's in one of these top three orientations, well, that looks like it would be really good to make a bond in one direction, not so good in the other directions, although it might make a double bond in the other direction, you know, there's, there's things here that I would want to know about in a chemistry context to say, how is that going to play out for bonding? And so look at the electron density function, which is loading. <laughs> you see, it's complicated. And it says see below for links to images of the other ones. Where's the images of the other ones? Is it here, the images? Wait, you... No, that's just going to be information. That's boring. Go ahead. Say what? And, if you go back, and, and click that link. Well, no, if, if you go... it, the, it said see below. Oh, right here. These are the links. Okay, so which one do we want to see? <laughs> that's kind of cool. Okay, enough of that's kind of cool. Let's get back to physics. Now I got to get used to things working the way they're supposed to. If we want to find the value of angular momentum, we're going to use the same method we had before, psi operator, psi, well, psi star operator psi, integrate over all space. That's how we're going to find expectation values. Now, we are going to work with the angular momentum operator, r cross, oh, man, I put m r cross p. That puts the m in twice. 
Yeah. Fixed it. <laughs> Same momentum as R cross P. You guys remember doing cross products? You put, these are the unit operators for X, Y, and Z direction. Sometimes written as I hat, J hat, K hat, or X hat, Y hat, Z hat. And then you put the components of the R vector here, components of momentum vector, you do the cross product, and you have, for instance, this is equal to E X hat times the, the determinant of its co-matrix, which is Y P Z minus Z P Y. Notice the order of multiplication is important because these are operators. So it's the second times the third in both cases. <clears throat> so that's in the X direction. Hence, this here is my LX. That's not an X. And so you can see the LX, LY, and LZ are just built up from doing that cross product. <clears throat> We're going to end today by doing commutators. <laughs> So let's start with who wants to volunteer first? I'm a brave boy. <laughs> okay, he is a brave boy. Otherwise known as, he could either be brave or smart and lazy. Either one works. What's the commutator of LX with itself? Zero. Always. Yes. <laughs> it always commutes with itself. So that was a good choice to volunteer first. So now we go to Chris. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have LX, LY, acting on the side. Oh. Let's not even worry about psi yet. We've got a long ways to go before we get that point. So LX and LY minus LY and LX. Now, equals LX is YPZ minus ZPY. And then we have LY, which is ZP. Okay, so you see I, I, I zoomed out so I could read these definitions to put in here. So LY, ZPX, yeah, minus XPZ. So that's the first one, minus... All right, this is getting more fun by the moment. I wrote the first term for you. Dang. Uh, minus the YPZ, XPZ. I'm going to shrink this. In which case, in which case we can pull that out. Okay, that, that is the next important step here. Minus what? What? What did you say before? I forget. Well, you said Y P Z. Y P Z X P Z. In which case, because that's acting in the Z direction, can pull out the X. Yes. So we we have a lot more to go, but I'm going to take what you're saying now. So okay. this so. one here, X will interact with X. Y will interact with, interact with Y and so on. But Y, P, Z, those aren't going to have any relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So I can just rearrange anything that's not the same. So I'm going to put Y, P, X out front, and then I have P, Z, Z. The order of these two matters. The others don't matter. Likewise here, go ahead. 
right well, I, I, I'm going to shorten this one as well. So this is going to be yx pz pz. Okay, so now go on with the bad self. Our next term is y <laughs> minus uh, z squared pyx. Where he did the work in his head. Plus, we have uh, z, well, uh, you have zx. PY, PZ, or however you want to order that. Okay, so I'm going to put the stuff that I can move around first. So I'm going to put PYX, because those can move around. Well, you can, yeah. But those have to stay in that order. Okay. Why? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Why does, it, does it matter if we put the Z before the PY, or does it no. matter? If, okay. No, so I put, I put the things that... I put the things that matter together. And I put them on the right-hand side in each case. What did you say, Andy? Oh, we were just talking about the PZ versus Z, like Z acting on PZ, PZ acting on Yeah, that, that's going to be our normal IH bar, right? We already know the commutator, which is why I said let's not worry about putting the psi in now because... We're going to be able to evaluate this based on already knowing that commutator. Okay, so we're having. Well, why, why don't we shift it to Andy? I know Andy took the easy way out, but. <laughs> well, uh, so I got a minus uh, uh, y p x z. And a plus z squared pxy. I don't know. I put the z squared at the end. I don't think I even did that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we got plus uh, xy pzy. And a minus um, let's see, uh, x p y p z z. <laughs> okay. So now we look at this and we say, what are we going to get when we put it all together? It's good that I can adjust the screen so we can see it all. So we have PZZ here, PZZ here, and then this is YPX and XPY with PZZ. Does that look right so far? Yeah. Okay, then so, no. Then for the next one, I have the, yeah, PZ, PZ, and PZ, PZ is here, so it's going to be, I'm going to put the one that's positive first. Minus. Well, what is that term going to give us? Let's let's make life easy. That, that should be zero. That's going to be zero because PZ commutes with itself. <laughs> XY doesn't matter because they don't interact. YX, all the same. The, these orders we could change. Notice we could change these orders, but that's YPX and that's XPY, so it's not the same thing. It's not the same, yeah. And then you have a... A Z, P, Z. Okay, so I have a ZPZ, Z. and actually the next one is PYPX. Oh wait, no, that's the one we did. I'm back. No, we have, we, we have no, we haven't done it. 
So z squared py px, if there's another one of those, they should subtract away, right? Do we have another z yeah. squared px py? So these two are going to add up to zero. So plus zero for those two. And now we get to the last one. Whoops. Didn't I just do the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was like, some, something's wrong about what I just did. Yeah, Z, P, Z. That's these two terms here. And P, Y, X minus Y, P, X. There. Okay, so it got simpler. Now these, the order of P, Y, and X doesn't matter. Right, they don't interact. So I can rewrite these. I'm just going to put the P's at the end of both ones. So I'll have Y, P, X minus X, P, Y, P, Z, Z plus x p y minus y p x z p z or not being quite such a slow person yes So now we just look, we say, wait, YPX minus XPY. YPX minus XPY. Minus LZ. PZZ. Front cover of the book, because I never remember if it's plus or minus. Minus IH bar. Yeah. Now, did we do it right? Yes. It's kind of a good feeling to do it right. <sighs> I am six and a half minutes over. I truly apologize. I did not. I, I didn't know we were going to end with commutators. <laughs> so there's a lot more commutators that we're not going to do. We will start with the ladder operator for angular momentum next class period. Okay, so if on a test, if we have to put off a commutator with these things, should we not put sine these things, or should we just just have memorize memorized anyways? Okay, the um the the way to make that judgment is if you have to evaluate the commutator, not knowing it, that it's you know not knowing a sub commutator that's going to come out, then you always have to put the psi in there. But if, you know, in this case, I knew from the beginning that it was going to rearrange, so I had another commutator. I don't want to put size in all over the place because it's going to be more writing. It's not going to be wrong to put the size in. It's just going to be more writing. And so what I always do is when I'm going to have to do some manipulation like this, I don't put the sign in until I get to the point where I'm like, wow, I have to evaluate this. I have a commutator I don't know. Yeah, okay. okay. Sounds good. All right. Have a happy Sabbath. Oh, you too.